John, what do you think about Bitcoin? I'm thinking about day trading. I'm going to get my real estate license. What do you think about multi-level marketing? All of these, what I call below the line, quick fix solutions, thinking that <clears throat> by buying these programs, it's going to change their life. And that's the problem. People are looking for this quick money-making fix rather than, like you said, educating themselves. And that's why I always say, I always tell these people, play the cash flow game first before you do any of this stuff. Otherwise, you're just wasting time, time energy, and money. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, The Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And today's a very, it's actually an SOS show. I mean, it, it is an emergency show. Yeah. And we slotted it in because um, there's a lot of people who may or may not know they're in big financial trouble. And our guest today is a longtime friend, fellow Hawaiian uh, rugby player for the Hawaii Harlequins. And they have been friends for years, but I, I hated him initially because he told me he was a financial planner. And, <laughs> and I said, well, you're on the dark side, you son of a bitch. But we've always been friends, but I found out he had the same points of view I did. So let me give an idea why I call this. And his name is John McGregor. He's the author of a book, uh, the, 10 top, the 10 Top Reasons Why Rich People Go Broke. And my concern is today, there's a lot of people, maybe they're not rich, <clears throat> but they're going to go broke. So uh, this, this is the SOS show from Rich Dad. We're slotting it in tight. Well, let me give you my background on this whole thing about um, why we're in this crisis. This is 1974. I was just getting out of the Marine Corps. I was stationed in Hawaii, Kaneohe Bay Marine Corps Air Station. And I was looking for a job. And so I, got, I went and I got a job with the Xerox Corporation, not because I love Xerox machines, but I had to learn how to sell. And that was the main reason. So I interviewed with two companies, IBM and Xerox. And I took Xerox. At the same time, there was this new thing called ERISA, which I really wasn't paying much attention to, but because I was interviewing with people, I kept hearing things called ERISA. And ERISA stands for Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And every time they say the governments tell you they're going to secure your retirement, you know it's toast. I mean, I don't trust my government as far as I can throw it, and you can't throw it anywhere. So ERISA then led to this thing called the 401k. So over the next couple of years, like say 74 to like 78, I saw this exodus of school teachers leaving the profession because my full family of school teachers, and they were becoming financial planners. It was, it sounded good, like they're experts and all this. And all I was saying to my sick and not so politically correct dark side, this, this is the poor leading the foolish. You know? And I said, we're going to have a disaster coming. So you have these guys who know nothing about money, school teachers or all these other people who are just quitting their jobs to have a profession called a financial planner and then they were advising people who knew nothing about money about their financial future. I said, man, there's going to be a train wreck in the future. Well, this is the show. The SOS is here. So if you are an old guy like me, a baby boomer who's had a 401k or an IRA, what I call defined contribution, DC pension plans, this is your show. And if you're a young person with a 401k, you know, I'll take laps around the rosary beads for you tonight. You're an idiot. Now, one more thing I want to say here is this. We don't make recommendations. We don't tell people what to do because that's the problem. That's the re primary reason people get in financial trouble. They want to be told what to do. And naturally, they'll tell them the same old garbage, the Susie Orman rhetoric, cut up your credit cards, live below your means. Invest in a well-diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. Bullshit. I would never do that. But I don't have to do that. You see, you might have to do that. There's a difference. So that's why my advice depends upon who you are. Or what I do depends upon who you are. Most people, <clears throat> not to be tooting my own horn, but most people can't do what I do. What I practiced for all these years, you know, since I was a kid. So this is what this show is about, because you might be in financial trouble. Your parents, your grandparents might be in severe financial trouble today. 
because that 1974 act, the ERISA Act, which led to the 401k and the IRAs and Roth IRAs, was specially designed for people who want to be told what to do. Go to school, get a job. You know, Dave Ramsey is a friend of mine, and he says live debt-free. And truthfully, most people should do that, but I would never do that. Debt is money. So I come from the other side of the coin. It's all, all coins of three sides, heads, tails, and the edge. So on the other side of the coin is Dave Ramsey saying live debt-free, and most people should because they don't know how to handle debt. On the other side of the coin is I went to school to learn how to handle debt, how to raise capital using other people's money. And <clears throat> when you've lost somebody's money, it's pretty frightening. And so that's why I don't do this stuff. So again, once, honestly, the Rich Dad Radio Show does not make recommendations. We don't tell you what to do because that's the problem. You got conditioned to be led by foolish people to tell, who tell you what to do with your money. And I meet some of the young people, oh, I've got a great job. It's got a 401k. You know, I drop to my knees and take laps around the rosary beads. I said, this person's in severe trouble down the road. So welcome to the program, John. Always great to be with you, Robert. Always fun. And yeah. I couldn't, I, nothing more timely than this episode right now, given what's going on. Yeah. And, so you, and by the you, way, let me just say, I'm a recovering financial planner. I've gone through the 12-step program. I am <laughs> dis distance myself from that because that approach, the traditional methods of financial planning, I finally realized does not work. And we can get into that. But anyway, it's great to be with yeah. you. And what is the title of your book? That's the top 10 reasons the rich go broke. And it's powerful stories of people I knew that had everything. And you knew a lot of them as well. And then they lost it all. And although it's a book about why the rich go broke, it's really why, really why the masses are broke and struggling and living paycheck to paycheck. So uh, if, you know, let's say you're 65 years old, you just set, you're set to retire, even 401k, what would you say to that person? I mean, we're not giving advice again, but. Yeah. Well, I'd be very, very nervous right now. It's a really challenging time right now to be that 65 year old wondering, hey, I want to retire, but. How am I going to do that on my 401k assets? Um, and, and, and this analysis, of, it's not an analysis, it's a fact that Social Security is going to be running out by 2034. Um, we're looking at the perfect storm. So people must get proactive right now. They cannot just bury their head in the sand, as I've seen so many people do. Well, one, one more thing. Let's, so let's say you're a 30-year-old and you're saying, oh, I got a high-paying job and I got a 401k. What would you say to them? Well, I mean, that's great. I, you know, I, on this show many times, I've defended the 401k, not because it's a great retirement vehicle. It's because it's really the only retirement people, uh, vehicle most people have. It was never designed to be the sole retirement vehicle for people. It was meant to be a supplement to people's pensions. But now the pensions are basically gone away. Companies aren't offering them anymore. And those that do are really curtailing the benefits. So now the 401k is really the sole retirement vehicle for most people. So if you're 30, I would definitely take advantage of it. But what I would be doing is educating myself to create my own passive income, building assets that generate cash flow. You cannot rely on your employer for your financial future. Yeah, basically what you're saying is get active and not yeah. get proactive. And that's what the whole Rich Dad Company was founded for, was for those of you who want to learn how to be a capitalist, basically, how to manage your own freaking money. Why turn it over to an idiot? I never understood that. No, well, and, and by the way, this is not a paid endorsement. I tell this to everybody. The first thing they should be doing is playing the cash flow game. Because Robert, you talk about context all the time. There's no better way to build context over what you want to do in your life and really understand how the system works. That I would just play that over and over and over again. That is a game changer, especially right now. Right, thank you. Because you know, the reason Kim and I created the cash flow board game was to awaken your financial genius. Because everybody's smart when it comes to money. You know, I, I mean, I was talking to a, a five-year-old kid, and the kid knew the difference between a one-dollar bill and a five-dollar bill. I mean, the guy could count, which most, mm -hmm. I can't say for most people. But anyway, <laughs> but if you awaken your financial genius, I mean, getting rich is fun. It's the most fun game I play. Yeah. And the reason I like it is because markets go up and markets go down. You know, it's like life. Mm -hmm. And it's just real life. But yeah. most people, so awaken your financial genius and take control of your financial future.
Mm-hmm. So that's what happened for me was that when having a rich dad and a poor dad, I saw my poor dad, a PhD from Stanford and Chicago and University of the Northwest, Northwestern. He was just so content to have a PhD <laughs> and a job and a government pension, which uh, the government pension is kind of a defined benefit plan where it's you guaranteed a paycheck for life. That's defined benefit. And that's why so many people are government employees, which is why our government's going broke. Because <laughs> we've got all these people who get a government job for the defined benefit pension plan. We all know that, and the government's broke. That's a defined benefit pension plan. And then in 1974, they shuffled off to Buffalo, all the baby boomers, into defined contribution, which meant you had to contribute to it. And if it was there when you retired, good luck, you know, I mean, you're lucky, but if it's not there, and that's what we're saying with this SOS show, it might not be there. So John, you know, the difference between active and proactive being told what to do and all this, what are you doing? I mean, you're a certified financial planner, which is a milestone above, you know, it's like being an accountant. Yeah. What's the difference between a certified financial planner and a financial planner? Well, that's a great question. You know, you know how long it takes to become a financial advisor? Six weeks. <laughs> Past the series seven, and now you are a financial advisor, capable and uh, <laughs> legally able to manage people's life savings. You know, I was took my dog to the uh, dog wash uh, person the other day, and there's a poster in there, and it said, "Our dog washers have a year and a half of experience before they're allowed to wash dogs." <laughs> And here's a financial advisor who sits for an exam in six weeks, and now is the uh, and now is the mentor of your money. It's it's really astonishing, you know. It, like like we always talk about the hairstylist. It takes a year and a half to become a hairstylist. The problem is when a hairstylist makes a mistake, the hair grows back. When a financial planner makes a mistake, it doesn't. I, I could just tell you countless examples. I've spent years coaching financial advisors, and it's amazing how little they don't know. Most of them are very very good people. They just don't know what they don't know. Reminds me of a time where I shared an office with an insurance salesman. And suddenly he got his Series six, series 65, which is even less, uh, which is much easier to get than the Series 7. And now he's an investment expert. This happens all the time. It's a key story in my book. You know, the four most dangerous words I hear, I trust my advisor. I mean, that's the most dangerous thing you could possibly do right now. Um, I mean, I've seen that countless times. But here's a perfect example of it. Couple comes into my office, they're approaching retirement, and they're like, John, we, we referred to you or we saw you on TV. We trust you. Here's our money. Just take it. No questions are asked, nothing. I try to explain my philosophy, what I do, what I charge. And they say, John, we trust you. Take our money. And that happens over and over again. That's the chicken dinner syndrome, right? Couple gets invited to the free chicken dinner, and they're just wowed by the presentation and the free dinner. And before the, before the presentation's over, they're willing to, to, to hand over to all their money to this stranger without any due diligence. It's, it's an absolute mess. So, so John, you, you start off as a financial planner and you were training other financial planners. So you, you, and you're a certified financial planner. When did the lights kind of go on for you personally? Well, it was about 12 years ago. I remember it distinctly. You and I and Kim and JW were having dinner, and I was explaining to you the frustration I was having with my clients. And it was a typical scenario of the thousands of clients that I've worked with, tried to help and coach. They'd sit in my office and they'd say, okay, John, let's do this. And I would, they would lay out all their financial information, their statements, and I didn't put it into the system. And I would immediately see that they're headed for disaster. The graph was showing them if they continue doing what they're going to do, they're never going to be able to retire the way they want or when they want. And they would get all nervous and excited and they'd be jabbing each other going, honey, we got to get serious. So I then map out a plan, a blueprint for success with all the strategies, the tactics, and the tools, and everything they needed to do as a bulletproof plan. And we would high five and we'd shake and we'd pinky swear that they were 100% committed to the plan that we just laid out. And they would run off into my office. And as soon as they left my office, they were on their way to Best Buy or an electronics store to buy a new flat screen TV on a credit card that's already maxed out. So in other words, all that planning, all that information that I poured into them had a shelf life of like 10 minutes to a day before they're back to living the same life, the same habits, the same behaviors, back to what I call living on pain island. 
all that planning did nothing to affect real meaningful change. And what I realized and the, at that dinner, it's when JW reached out and leaned in. He was John, because that old school stuff does not work. It's because information does not cause transformation. Information does not cause transformation. That's what I realized all this time. I was just pouring information into people thinking that that was going to affect change because this isn't a lack of information because there's plenty of information out there. People are showing what to do. This is a behavioral issue. Right. And the only way to change behavior is at the core of someone's mental programming. That was my epiphany, my aha moment when I realized that the traditional methods of financial planning does not work for most people. So I know that's my long winded answer. So we're going to go to a break, but I want to go back to what my favorite uh, scapegoat is, is our education system. Yeah. You know, I mean, our, our education system is so corrupt, broken, and woke right now. Yeah. Most academics have this point of view. I'm not interested in money. So we come back, we're going on more with John McGregor, dear friend. And the, by the way, JW is this lunatic we played rugby with from Hawaii also. And he saw the light and he went into education, which is another problem. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It's Only rugby. JW. Because we're right into the fire. <laughs> but when rugby players start becoming educators, we're in deep trouble. We'll be right back. Are you worried about your financial security in these unprecedented times? If you are, the next minute could profoundly impact your financial security. Imagine waking up to find the economy has plunged and your portfolio has plummeted 30 to 45 percent while banks are in turmoil holding your money hostage while waiting for FDIC intervention. Where would you turn? For many, this may sound like fiction, but it's a stark reality for those that have money on the line. Recently, America's awoke to both the NASDAQ and the Dow, plummeting over 1,100 points each and triggering a frenzy of sell-offs. History shows us how a single event can crash the market. Like the dot-com bubble of 1999, the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008, and the pandemic of 2020. But today, we're facing multiple bubbles. Commercial real estate, stock, bonds, and banks. Combined with the relentless inflation, the threat of global recession, the specters of war, and you have the perfect storm. The consequences could be catastrophic, plunging us into unprecedented crisis. America is siding in the age of discord, with trust in institutions collapsing and the democratic norms unraveling. The quality of life for Americans has declined. Wealth is concentrated among the rich, while the median American family income stagnates, creating a dangerously top-heavy social pyramid. Moreover, hostile countries like Russia, China, and Iran are working to destroy the U.S. dollar. Gold is a no-matter-what store of wealth that you need. That's why Robert has been such an advocate of gold, and he trusts Allegiance Gold. Allegiance Gold is ready to help you incorporate physical gold, as part of your portfolio and protected against economic uncertainty. Visit protectwithrobert.com today to learn how you can qualify for up to $5,000 in free silver with a qualifying investment. Or give them a call at 844 robert Remember to mention Robert and Kim sent you when you contact Allegiance Gold. Secure your IRA or 401k today with Allegiance Gold. Visit protectwithrobert.com or call 844-3-ROBERT. Welcome back, Robert. Yes, I can the Rich Dad Radio Show. This is our SOS show, Save Our Savings Show, we should say it. So our guest today is John McGregor, Rich Dad Advisor. And we brought him on board because we do need a financial planner's pro profile because most of our friends are entrepreneurs and they have no idea what financial planners do. So we have, so anyway, he's, he's talking about what a, what you can do now, given the state of the economy. And if you're by holding, praying for your retirement, let's say you're 65, you might be in serious trouble. I think the baby boom generation, they're out of time. And let's hope we're wrong, but that's why this is an SOS session. Old friend of ours, John McGregor. And John, um, one thing about Rich that we don't, I want to say this, we don't tell people what to do. We don't yeah. give financial advice. We don't say buy real estate or buy stocks or buy bonds or sell or some of that stuff. I'm I'm 100% cash. I've moved completely out of the market. Having said that, I do generate cash flow by trading options. It's a very successful strategy that I've incorporated. I have my books, my online course. I don't work for a paycheck. I haven't worked for a paycheck in 15 or 20 years now. Um, but I am extremely proactive. 
and um, and I'm always educating myself all the time, as you are, Robert. We're always I mean, we we get together as friends and all this. We're always like with George Gammon and Kenny McElroy and Tom Wheelwright. We're always discussing money and money strategies, which goes back to before the break. I've you know I grew up in a family of government employees. And their whole thing is a self-righteous attitude is I'm not interested in money. I just want to do a good job for the community. Biggest lie I ever heard. You try to take their paycheck away, they fight like dogs. They'll bite you in the hand. But they're not interested in money because money is the root of all evil. You know? And that's what, that's what I hear going on all the time. So anyway, John, you know, you, you thought throw trade options. I mean, did you just one night start trading options and make a million dollars? No, I mean, it took, me a, it took me a while to figure this out, but the strategy I'm using is not complicated. It doesn't require advanced math. You don't even, even under, need to understand the economy to do what I'm doing. It's a very simple, well-written strategy. My 92-year-old father is implementing this strategy. He's been using the strategy for five years. He's generating ten dollars to $15,000 a month in his spare time as a, as a hobby. So no, this stuff is not complicated. But to your point, Robert, I mean, I tell people over and over again, I get the, I get the, the emails and the messages from people that are struggling. They're like, what do I do? And then I, you know, I try to tell them some things that they should be doing, but it just, they, they, they won't do it because they're just fat and happy. They've never been through anything like this. And, and it was, you know, it always reminds me of what, what Mark Twain said. He said, no amount of evidence will ever persuade an idiot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's sadly, so many people today are living with their head in the sand, you know, and they're, they're going to wake up one day and they're going to see their 401k balance in half and their pension benefits that they've worked 30 or 40 years for cut in half because there's no money, despite this guarantee that, that some agency, uh, you know, promised them, or, you know, so. So I'll just, you know, my, my very first book long before Rich Dad Poor Dad was a book called You Want to Be Rich and Happy, Don't Go to School. So let's start yeah. this whole thing off is when, when financial planners became the, the fad, uh, new profession, you know, every school to you, not every, but you know, they were just leaving in droves. Yep. I said so that was the, the poor leading the blind. Yeah. It's just shocking what's happened. Our problem is education. I mean, it's so hardcore Marxist right now. Cause my, my book is capitalist manifesto is that is the communist man, uh, game plan. It has always been to invade higher education. So in 1930, the Frankfurt School sent teachers to Columbia University in New York. And that's when the student protests began. And they began, America became communist through our education system. Yep. So that's why I've been fighting and writing and all this. Another thing too about options is that just because John doesn't mean that you should do it. Because I studied options for about three years. And I'm a Marine where our brains aren't that fast. <laughs> Or, well, you know, I just don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't enjoy it, don't do it. So that's, I'm a real estate guy. And I'm making more money than ever before today. But because I am a, pro, a proactive investor, I was just saying to John, I just, I just sold two properties that we made quite a bit of money on. And I said, where do you put your money? Well, you put it in cash. I bought Wagyu bulls, you know, breeding bulls. And I've always, you know, this, this is a Japanese breeding bull, which I always wanted to be, but never got there. But anyway, you can, well, I'm in the food business now. And I'm in the oil business, you know, because oil, and I'm not, I'm not stock business. I don't trust stocks or bonds. I never have. I don't have any. Well, I do have some, but they're companies I took public. But I am proactive. And most people, like you say, want to be told what to do. So I write about what I do in all my books. There's a difference there. So I just said, just recently, I sold two pieces of land. I made $400,000 and I'm putting it into Wagyu cattle and calves. I mean, and cows. And next May, they drop more cattle. So it's called cash flow. You know? <laughs> and um, it's not that hard to do, but you have to kind of know what you're doing. So my whole strategy being a Marine and a C student and never been bright in school, I always ask people who are doing what I wanted to do. So my friend who is investing in the bulls, that's what he does. He invests in bulls. And this bull is a half million bucks. And he breeds, you know, probably several hundred cows a year. And think of all the calves that drop from that. That's leverage. You know, I just kind of like the whole formula. 
and I like to eat. Now, if you don't like to eat beef, then chew on some celery. You know, I don't really care. But you get your, your little personal <clears throat> dignity up there, and you miss the whole point here. Invest in what people need. People need oil. I invest in it. People need housing. I invest in it. People need food. I invest in it. There's a very big difference, but I invest with people who are doing what we invest in. Any comments on that, John? Yeah, you know, it just reminds me of the first time I walked into your kitchen 15 years ago, and all I saw on the kitchen counter were books. And it just struck me because not only do you read books, you devour books. Because the, by, by the time you've been through a book one or three times, which you often do, it is loaded with those little sticky tabs for important keynotes. So I think that the overarching theme here and why this show is so important and so successful is this all about education, all about education. Yes, the school system robbed you of any money, money education, but you can't blame them. It's time to move on and start educating yourself. And, and, that, and that's the key to this. You cannot sit back and wait for someone else or some other entity to take care of you. There's an absolute train wreck of the strategy. That's the strategy I call hope. And hope is not a retirement strategy. <laughs> Sadly, too many people use hope as their strategy. But the, the worst thing, John, is a lot of those people you talked to years ago, they're too old now. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's the problem. That's the problem. Um, so let me ask one of the final questions. What do, as a new financial planner, like as a new Xerox salesman, I was trained to uh, sell yeah. against IBM at the time. IBM machines. So as a financial planner, what do you tell your clients who get nervous? Yeah, the, the, the traditional rules that we were taught that I was taught back in the day by the best firm on Wall Street was buy and hold, stay for the long term. It's not timing, it's time in the market. Those are the cliches that we were taught because they don't want us taking money out of the, taking our clients money out of the market because then there's no revenue, right? There's no assets under management. So it's they like, want us to stay- that's the key word. What does assets under management mean? They say, we have a billion dollars under management. What does yeah. that mean? Yeah, these are the commercials you see on television, right? We're different. We're fiduciaries. We don't charge. It's all nonsense. Assets under management, basically an investment firm or a financial advisor that's trying to gather as much assets as they possibly can, manage those in the stock and bond market, and then charge an asset-based fee doing that. So that's what the... So we're not going to mention any names here because I don't, I, I want to stay alive here, <laughs> but you know, I watch these TV commercials. It's, we're different here. We don't make money unless you make money. What do you think when you see that? That's just absolute BS. Um, it's, it's just, it's so false and so untrue. They don't do anything different than any one other, any other financial manager. No financial manager, asset managers charge commissions. They say, well, we don't charge. They're a fiduciary, which is total nonsense. That word is so overplayed. It's basically a marketing tool for financial advisors. I can clearly show that you'd be more safe as a working with a non-fiduciary than you would with a fiduciary. And by the way, this whole fiduciary word, the biggest financial scam in world history, Bernie Madoff, and he was a fiduciary. So this notion that you're protected by a fiduciary is nonsense. I'm not saying fiduciary advisors are bad. I'm just saying do not trust somebody just because they say they're a fiduciary. What's, what is a fiduciary? Fiduciary, well, you have, you have two sets of rules. A fiduciary is that you're working in the client's best interest, where a non-fiduciary is you're offering the most suitable investments. So it's suitability versus best interest. And it always sounds great that my advisor is working in my best interest rather than somebody who's just being suitable. But I will tell you, the fiduciary advisor, it's the wild west. There's very little oversight as a fiduciary. You're your own compliance manager. You can invest in anything. No one monitors what you say, what you send, what you present. It's like I said, it's very much the wild west for a lot of these fiduciary advisors. So Again, I would not fall into that trap. It's a dangerous trap, and too many advisors are using it as a marketing ploy to attract new clients. So fiduciary in technical terms means you work on the best behalf of the client. Yes, correct, correct. And your non-fiduciary means you're doing what's good for you. <laughs> well, you're doing what's suitable. 
And in all my years coaching both advisors, fiduciary and non-fiduciary, I've never heard a non-fiduciary say, well, I'm just recommending stuff because it's suitable. No, 99% of advisors are trying to do the right thing for their clients, um, regardless if they're a fiduciary or not. And if they don't do the right thing for their clients, I'm telling you, they have so much compliance oversight, monitoring everything they say, do, recommend, that you know, it's, it's very difficult to, I mean, it, it happens all the time, but it's very difficult, more difficult to scam a client as a non-fiduciary than it is a fiduciary. Another ad I see, it's, a, it's the same company, They're, they advertise the most, and it's, you know, Ken McElroy now would say, the more they advertise, the worse the investment. <laughs> or the, in real estate, the better big, brochure. The bigger the brochure, the worse the property is. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So when somebody says, we don't make commissions, we don't charge, we don't sell commission product, now, what does that mean to you? Well, this old notion, this was back in the day when a money manager was buying and selling stocks and bonds, you get a commission every time. That is so old school, that doesn't happen anymore. So these money managers, whether it's a mutual fund or an asset manager um, or third party managers, we call them, they don't charge commissions when they're buying and selling within that portfolio. They're charging the asset-based fee. So the fact that they say that they're not charging commission is, is, at, is, is, is rather ludicrous. It's a lie, isn't it? It's a lie. You know, it's a fabrication like they're doing something better than others because they don't charge a commission. No one charges commission, but, you know, it's, just, it's, it's ridiculous. So they get money for assets under management. Yeah, and then the other thing is they say at the end, we do better when our clients do better. Well, that's true, but when the client does worse, like in these markets, they're still getting their asset-based fee. They're still making money uh, on a smaller amount of money, but they're still gathering their, their fee. So again, that whole commercial is so misleading, and I, I'm surprised they haven't been called out by now um, by the regulators. And then <clears throat> there's, a, there's a certain female that's famous on television, especially PBS. Oh yeah, your friend. My friend, she's <laughs> cut up your credit cards and yeah. live below your means and diversify, diversify. I call yeah. it diversification, diversify. <laughs> you know, just diversify your account. Yeah. This person was charged with something, right? We won't mention her name. Yeah. What was she charged with? It was credit card fraud. I think it was a debit card fraud, amongst other things. I mean, you just Google her name, and boy, there are so many documentaries and videos on how she scammed people. It's 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 quite a shame, actually. It's sad because it ruins the whole industry. But she's a star of PBS. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then so many people are been trained because they go to school. Tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. It's, it's why 78% of people, working adults, these aren't homeless people, these are working adults, 78% of them are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. That's why. Tell me what to do. So let me give you an example of that. You know, Dave Ramsey is a friend of mine. His, his advice is solid. You know, live debt free. But the other side of the coin is somebody like me. Mm -hmm. And what I studied was how do I use debt as yeah. money? Because debt became money in 1971. You know, so I learned how to borrow money because debt is tax-free. Then I invest in property, and then I get my income tax-free because of appreciation, depreciation, and amortization. I used to tax laws. But that takes study. You don't just do it overnight. So that's Ken McElroy's books, ABCs of Real Estate, ABCs of Real Estate Investing. But you've got to study. If you want to be told what to do, just listen to the TVs and uh, pray. I mean, the buy, hold, and pray, I call it. The problem is, Robert, and we've seen this in the, in the uh, events that we've spoken at around the world. Is every single event, we get these people coming up to us. John, what do you think about Bitcoin? I'm thinking about day trading. I'm going to get my real estate license. What do you think about multi-level marketing? All of these, what I call below-the-line, quick-fix solutions, thinking mm -hmm. that by buying these programs, it's going to change their life. And... That's the problem. People are looking for this quick money-making fix rather than, like you said, educating themselves. And that's why I always say, I always tell these people, play the cash flow game first before you do any of this stuff. Otherwise, you're just wasting time, time energy, and money. Yeah. yeah, you have to do something. Do something. So once again, John, thank you very much. This is SOS show. Uh, John is an advisor, a dear friend. Look, you guys, you take financial advice from financial planner or something, but take 
financial advice from a rugby player, you better get educated. So thanks, John. Thanks for being part of this program. Thanks so much. Always fun. Right. And we'll be right back. Thanks, John. Welcome back to Barbecue Select Rich Chat Radio Show, the good news and bad money, bad news about money. This is our SOS show because it's bad news for a lot of people. On the other side of the coin, it's actually good news because during a crash is when you make most of your money. So with that, I want to thank John McGregor and for the show. Again, we don't give financial advice, especially listening to rugby players. Definitely don't listen to us, but listen to what we do. The difference is we do things differently. So <clears throat> I don't do option trading like John does, but I do buy Japanese cattle. Now, can I give a plug for back up with John? The reason we Kim and I created the cash flow board game before I wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad was to awaken your financial genius because you have to do it. You have to fill out the numbers. You see how the cash is flowing through the income statement, balance sheet, and a statement of cash flow, which is what your banker wants to see is your financial statement, not your grade point average. Right. Stupid people. Who cares what your grades were if you're broke, you know? But anyway, the reason for the cash flow board game is you have to do something. Mm -hmm. So thank you for listening to this Rich Dad SOS show. Thank you very much. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.